Yo, what's good YouTube? I'm back with another reaction video and we got the Boston Celtics history in the 90s with Reggie Lewis, Dino, Antonio, Antonio Walker, and Rick, I can't say his name, Pateno. Anyway, let's get straight into the video, man. You're not keeping short and sweet, man. Still recovering from my sickness. I'm getting a little bit better. So that's why I'm able to knock out some of these videos. But uh, yeah, I've been drinking tea and all of that. But uh, let's get straight into the video. Y'all subscribe if you're new. Hit that like button. Turn on that bell. I'm trying to upload every single day. So far, we haven't stopped yet. And I'm trying not to let the sickness stop me, man. So uh, yeah, let's get straight into it, y'all. Let's see what this video is hitting for. Some of my earliest memories of NBA basketball were watching the Boston Celtics playing at home on CBS in the late 80s. There was something special and unique watching the Celtics play at the Boston Garden and at Hardwood, which is beautiful to view on TV. I somehow felt how special the Celtics were at the Garden on CBS and felt their history with the banners hanging from the Raptors. And then there was my neighbor from Boston telling me how great the Celtics have always been. But when the broadcast rights would go from CBS to NBC starting in 1990, for some reason watching home Celtics games on TV had a different vibe, but for Celtics fans, everything would be different than what they were used to. 90 Sports and Salts presents the Boston Celtics in the 90s. So the Celtics were obviously successful in the 80s, winning three championships in the decade and appearing in every Eastern Conference Finals except one from 1980 to 1988. Now I mentioned about how it seemed different watching the Celtics on their home court on NBC, but where I kind of recognized the decline of the Celtics was on a VHS tape of the second Dazzling Dunks and Basketball bloopers, and in that video there was a segment with Celtics coach Jimmy Rogers, who took over for Casey Jones who stepped away from coaching the Celtics after the 87-88 season. But anyways, the segment was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and for this segment it showed Boston's Hall of Famers Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and Dennis Johnson on the bench in street clothes. And I watched this Dazzling Dunks video so many times and this segment has always stuck with me and it kind of showed me that this would be the decline of the Celtics. Beginning with the 88-89 season to the 92-93 season, the Celtics would make it to the playoffs every season but would not make it back to the Eastern Conference Finals. Dennis Johnson's final NBA season would be the 89-90 season. Larry Bird, he'd retire after the 91-92 season. Kevin McHale would retire after the 92-93 season. And lastly, Hall of Famer Robert Parrish, his final season with Boston would be the 93-94 season where he was 40 years old at the time, but would play three more seasons with Charlotte and Chicago. It can be quite difficult for an NBA franchise to transition to where the core of your team is aging and declining to a new group of players yet still remain competitive. Boston had a very talented shooting guard in Reggie Lewis who was drafted 22nd overall in the 1987 NBA draft. And it's not crazy to say that Lewis was perhaps on track to being the second best shooting guard behind Michael Jordan. Lewis was that good. He could shoot so smoothly off the dribble. He could come off screens, had a quick first step to drive and finish, and could score in the post. Furthermore, Lewis was a very good defender, always played under control and didn't turn the ball over that much. Boston had a very talented player to build around going forward, but sadly, on July 27, 1993, during an off-season practice, the 27-year-old Lewis, he suffered a sudden cardiac death on the basketball court. Later on, the Celtics retired Lewis's jersey, number 35. Now going back- Wow, see that's why I like doing these videos, I did not know that. I had no clue, man, and nobody, I never knew that, I never knew he, wow. That's crazy. To the 1986 NBA draft, Boston was able to obtain the second overall selection and drafted the 6'8 Len Bias. Bias sadly passed away before ever playing an NBA game. It was so easy to see Bias's elite talent as that would have been some duo at shooting guard in small forward with Bias and Reggie Lewis. That could have rivaled Jordan Pippen in the 90s. Lewis was drafted as the second to last pick in the first round in 1987. So if Bias played, I think Lewis still would have been a Boston Celtic. But unfortunately and sadly, Bias and Lewis, they would not be part of the Celtics in the 90s. For the 93-94 NBA season, there would be a talented player coming over from Europe to finally play for Boston. That player would be Dino Raja, who was drafted by Boston in the second round for the 1989 NBA draft. Raja was part of those talented Yugoslavia teams of Vladi Divac, Tony Kukoc and Drazen Petrovic. But Raja is kind of the forgotten player among the names I mentioned. In fact, I think the 6'11 Raja was a better scorer than Divac and Kukoc. Raja, he was tough to defend. 
Boston was getting a really good score with the offensive talent to be an all-star, but perhaps he was not an elite player. Nonetheless, the 93-94 Boston Celtics, they had a season that Boston fans were not accustomed to seeing, as the Celtics did not make the playoffs for the first time since the 78-79 season. Around this period, I thought Raja was Boston's best offensive player. Along with Raja, Boston had players in D. Brown, Rick Fox, Sherman Douglas, Xavier McDaniel, Ed Pinckney, Kevin Gamble, and an aging Dominique Wilkins, and an undrafted gem in David Wesley. Boston was drafted around the middle of the first round, as their first round picks included A.C. Earl, Eric Montross, and Eric Williams. Only Eric Williams kind of showed some promise. But for the famed 1996 NBA draft, Boston made a good selection that would help the franchise move forward later on. That player would be Antoine Walker. Now I understand there are other players that could have been selected that would have been better like Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash, Jermaine O'Neal, and so forth. But Antoine Walker, he was a talented player. At 6'8", he could handle the ball, become a playmaker. Yeah, I used to like Antonio Walker too. That's the crazy part. I used to like him. I remember when he came around. I used to like him. Get his own shot off from the outside and in the post. And I also liked his hesitation move. Walker was one of the few power forwards who didn't mind driving to the basket with his weak hand. And Walker may not be that efficient of a scorer, would sometimes take bad or ill-advised shots, but nonetheless, Boston had a talented player. But for the 96-97 Boston Celtics, they had one of the worst defenses in the league and finished 15-67. and Former Celtic ML Carr, he was the coach and GM at the time and would not return to those roles but remained with the Celtics organization with the title of Director of Corporate Development. However, this was the lowest point thus far in Boston Celtics history. How would Boston get back to being competitive again? Their solution to hire an extremely successful college coach in Rick Pitino with a huge 10-year $50 million contract. Pitino would be the head coach and make the personnel decisions. For the 1997 NBA Draft, there was one player who would clearly be a franchise changer. That player would be Tim Duncan. Essentially, winning the draft lottery would change a franchise in a positive direction drastically. The Boston Celtics had the best odds of winning the draft lottery. In addition, Boston had Dallas's first round lottery pick to increase their odds of getting Tim Duncan. Instead, it was San Antonio who won the Tim Duncan sweepstakes as they had the second best odds due to David Robinson only playing six games. Boston received the third and sixth picks in the NBA draft. It was reported that ML Carr, who was representing the Celtics for the draft lottery, was asked by either Patino or someone for the Patino group to make an offer for the top pick that night, which put Carr kind of in an awkward position. Nonetheless, Duncan of course went first overall while the Celtics, they drafted Chauncey Billups and former Kentucky Wildcat, Ron Mercer. More on Billups later on, but as for Mercer, he was such a highly touted player coming out of high school, but in the NBA, Mercer became a decent shooting guard. Moreover, during the offseason, the Celtics had traded Dino Raja to the Philadelphia 76ers, but Philadelphia, they voided the trade after Raja failed the physical. The previous season, Raja had a knee injury that forced him to be able to only play in 25 games. Essentially, Patino Celtics, they felt they wouldn't be able to trade Raja, so Boston they decided to buy out the remaining three years on his contract, thus releasing Raja. Raja was quite disappointed, which resulted in Raja going back to playing Europe. In addition, Patino made several transactions before the season started and totally changed the roster. Nothing too major except maybe trading a young Eric Williams for a couple of second round picks. And Walter McCarty, he would be acquired in another trade as Boston would have three former Kentucky Wildcats who Patino coached in college in Antoine Walker, McCarty and Mercer. Patino would play a style from Kentucky with the pressing and attacking aggressively on offense. During the 97-98 season, the Celtics, they were near the 500 mark, but then in February, Patino traded the rookie point guard and Chauncey Billups, along with D. Brown, that landed Boston, Kenny Anderson. Now, at this point, Anderson, he was a solid veteran NBA point guard, but not the all-star he was in New Jersey, but he was a key player for Boston until the early 2000s. Looking four years after his trade, this looked like it was a good trade for Boston. For Billups, coming out of college, Billups wasn't a traditional point guard, but he could really shoot and score from the outside. And for Billups' first five seasons in the NBA with four different teams, Billups looked like he was just going to be a solid NBA point guard who could shoot from the outside but not be a playmaker. But then Billups went to Detroit and became a tremendous player offensively and defensively. It took some time for Billups to become a great player, which means as time went on, this trade looked bad for Boston. But anyways, Boston, they improved during Patino's first season, going 36-46. and 46. Then for the NBA draft, Boston had the 10th pick overall. Patino, he really wanted Dirk Nowitzki. And it was reported that Patino told the 7-foot German to skip the draft combine. 
but Tino, he was nervous that Dells would select Dirk Nowitzki because of Donny Nelson's reputation for scouting overseas. But once Dells drafted Robert Traylor at 6, Patino thought Nowitzki was all his. But Milwaukee, they selected Nowitzki at 9 and traded him to Dells. As a result, Patino, he was quoted as scurrying and then hadn't done his homework on Paul Pierce. But nonetheless, the Celtics, they decided to draft Pierce, and the former Kansas Jayhawk became one of the best I ever saw at isolating and shooting off the dribble, and would later become a Hall of Famer. It's crazy because Boston could have had a bunch of hair. Could have had Derek. Like, they could have had a bunch of good players, man. That's crazy, though. That's crazy. They imagine if they would have had Derek, yo. That's crazy. But Boston once again missed the playoffs, going 19-31 and in a shortened NBA season due to a lockout. Then for the 99-2000 season, it looked like Boston was going to miss the playoffs again as impatience was growing with the Boston fans and media which led to a famous NBA rant by Rick Pitino. Boston once again missed the playoffs going 35-47. Then for the 2000-2001 NBA season, after a 12-22 start, Rick Pitino, he resigned. His assistant Jim O'Brien took over as he got an ovation from the Boston faithful when he was introduced before the first game. As O'Brien seemed to be a much better coaching fit, as Boston would make the playoffs the following four seasons that included one Eastern Conference Finals appearance. The history of the Boston Celtics is incredible, but from 1993 to 2001, there is a gap of basically nothingness, as the Celtics never won more than 36 games in a season. The face of this period is perhaps Rick Pitino, who promised to revive the Celtics, but it never transpired. When college coaches take that next step to coach a pro team in either football or basketball, those coaches at colleges with their community like fan bases are often propped up as immortal like figures as college programs are about the coaches while franchises and the pros are about the players. Patino was a tremendous college coach, but it seemed like Patino got a huge ego while at Kentucky, which led to Patino never understanding the difference between coaching in college and coaching in the pros as Patino's constantly yelling instructions was always trying to be a control freak every every aspect of the game and not trusting his players more. Yes, college coaches, they will continue to be hired by pro franchises, but how will they work in that franchise? In fact, Boston hired a college coach in Brad Stevens and he was much different and had a better understanding than Rick Pitino. Real quick, I just want to thank all those who have supported 90 Sports Nostalgia. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, share, and check out the links below. Right, that was a good one right there, y'all. Damn, that was a good one. See, I didn't know a lot of stuff like that. I didn't know like has after Larry Bird and all those things happened like that. I thought it was pretty okay, but see, that's why sometimes you gotta learn things, man. Definitely gotta learn things. But that's crazy. They could have had some good players, man. They really could have had some good players. But hey, I guess things just happen, you know. But yeah, Boston could have definitely been good teams going on down the road after Larry Dirk Nowinski and. You know they should have kept Chauncey Billups, but yeah, man, that that was that was a good one. I liked that video. That was I learned. I just learned a lot about Boston after Larry Bird and all of that. That that was definitely a good one right there. But anyway, man, y'all not keep it short or sweet, man. I'm on to the next video, man. And uh, if y'all leave your comments down below, subscribe if you're new, hit that like button, turn on that bell. Uh, yeah, and that's about it, man. If y'all got some videos you want me to do, leave them down in the comments. Let me know your comments on this video. But, uh, yeah, I definitely, there's a lot of things I just learned in this after this, like, in the 90s of the Celtics, especially after Larry Bird and all of them, the, you know, retiring and leaving and stuff like that. Definitely just learned a lot. But, uh, yeah, man, that's about it, man. I love y'all. I'm out of this, John. Peace.